The weather has been rather unstable recently. Sometimes it would snow from nightfall straight through the dawn. Yet as times push forward, the asphalt pavement dry, leaving Tsubaki nothing but inconsistent blurred traces of white by the time she awakened. Tsubaki ignored her racing heart and stood as still as the street lamp, gazing at the familiar home her family was about to leave. The ants patrolled in squadrons near her feet. A black cloud of them gathered around a moth's broken wing and moved it to the colony in the garden. Perhaps the decaying innocence within Tsubaki's heart also served as a valuable food in preparations for the upcoming spring. Overwhelming kidnapping. The overwhelming kidnapping, her responsibility to her family, and her feelings for Kiyosuke might all be guiding her to a nest that most suited her true self. Hiroki walked out the door. He closed in on Tsubaki like a puppy. He made a fist, bent down, and then jumped with excitement. He looked up at Tsubaki with a bright floral smile. Her brother's every move was dear to her. She'll take Hiroki to kindergarten and then head to school. This was her daily routine. If Hiroki begged for a snack halfway, she would stop by a convenience store. If he wanted to play, she'd comply as long as time allowed. He was a child after all. As his big sister, it's only natural for her to indulge him. But today was different. Tsubaki wouldn't go to school. Instead, she'll wait for Kiyosuke to contact her. Depending on the schedule Kiyosuke set out for her, she might not even go to pick up Hiroki. She continued to hold onto her brother's hand. His chubby little arms were quite soft under her fingers. Her tone suddenly grew strict. Damn. Her brother's innocent smile made Tsubaki a touch uneasy. It was, as if, it was as if she'd seen the exact smile somewhere. As if she'd seen it in a sickening number of times. Within the polished goulash of the mirror. Every day of her life. Why? What was it all about? What was it about her brother that bothered her? As a twisted emotion gathered in her chest and ran down to her gut, she noticed that she was dripping with sweat. Kiyosuke must be an early riser. His call came a few short moments after 7 o'clock. After glancing at her brother as he hummed beside her, she took the cell phone in her hands. Does that inconvenience you? An inquisitional tone came from the other end of the line. Though Kosuke's tone changed often, there was a critical difference between this and the boy she became accustomed to at school. Tsubaki responded as if intimidated by his mannerism. Are you outside right now? Shall I infer that this means you're escorting a sibling to kindergarten? Tsubaki panicked when he pointed, pinpointed the situation right away. Come quickly. Right now. An alarm rang in Tsubaki's heart. She hadn't experienced such anxiety since her last meeting with Mao. She had neither the courage nor even the intent to defy him. Tsubaki's answer seemed to have satisfied Kyosuke. He thanked her and hung up. Kids are really good at reading people's feelings, she thought. The words Tsubaki wanted to say were stuck in her throat. Still, Tsubaki could only relax if she let the desire she'd only recently formed guide her. It's nothing strange for a girl her age to be happier with friends than family. Her brother had been kidnapped once. After learning of her brother's kidnapping, Tsubaki had burst into tears. She could do nothing but cry and shout. It's all because I was late picking him up.
Burying the perplexed emotions deep in her heart, she left her old self behind. Was it really such a cruel thing to do? Abandoning her brother to help the man she loves work? While it did come with the added cost of skipping school, it was nothing as severe as breaking the law. Nor was it an act atrocious enough to earn the contempt of others. It was merely taking a risk. Tsubaki, who was al always worried about such trivial things, suddenly noticed how insignificant she was. She couldn't help getting angry. Her brother knew nothing about Tsubaki's feelings and tilted his head. Tsubaki broke out in a sweat once more after being stared into by Hiroki's innocent pupils. Being put on the spot, she lied without thinking. In the end, Tsubaki still promised to pick up her brother, but this may have been a purely a function of remorse or guilt. She averted her eyes. Afterward, she silently made her way to Kiyosuke's house. The crowded train to Central Boulevard gave her the impression that everyone was watching her, leaving her unsettled all the while. I led Tsubaki to my room. When I met her at the station, she bore a grim, shadowed, alien expression. So, you really showed up. Um, is this your first time here? Ah, that's right. Are you feeling alright? I apologize for coming you over all of a sudden. Tsubaki weakly, weakly shook her head, indicating there was no problem. Is something troubling you? It's written all over your face. I laughed. Your relationship with your family hasn't been smooth lately, huh? She looked embarrassed like a child caught red-handed. Don't you think you've been a bit too easy on them in the past? I know it's difficult to manage a big family, but it isn't enough to do what needs to be done. You brought your brother to kindergarten before he arrived to you, didn't you? Uh. What? You didn't? Tsubaki only replied with a quiet nod. She seemed to have allocated my direction as, to as the top priority. She rushed here after leaving her brother. Yeah, it's like eight. Do you feel bad about it? You'll get used to it soon enough. Whether it's a problem or not is something a person should generally decide for oneself. But we don't have the time to waste over trivial things like that. So long as she's going to be following my directions. The old Tsubaki, that straight-laced and honest girl, would be questionable use of the... I was hoping for a relationship on par with those between cult leaders and their followers. No matter how ridiculous and inhumane the leader's commands become, the followers will always take them as gospel from God and obey. Does Tsubaki have the potential to become the zealous believer that I wish for? Hey, Tsubaki, are you interested in the reason I'm working like this? Tsubaki snapped her head in surprise after suddenly being asked a question. I decided to blow my cover and reveal everything. I might be living a luxurious life right now, but there was a time when I lived in absolute poverty. She sighed as her eyes betrayed her shock. I remember reading a random query on anthropology, anthropology and knowing about someone's past leads you to sympathize with them. I need to close the gap between me and Tsubaki. It started around the beginning of middle school. Prior to my enrollment there, I had a happy family. After a certain occurrence though, everything began to change. I know I'm the only one, I'm the one who brought it up and everything, but please don't ask about that. It's the source of many of many a headache. I slowly refreshed my memories. If I told you, you might not believe me. I recalled my past. I slowly opened the closed book to page one. Every time I look back, the same scenery appears before my eyes. Samejima Kyosuke, an ancient... A <laughs> an ancient... 
an anxious child alone in the dark room. If there was a nameless village in Hokkaido, my mom and I lived in a shack adjacent to the cattle fodder and hay storage of a small farm. When winter reached our home, the temperature dropped below zero. Our windows weren't double layered. The flooring reeked of cow feces and centipedes spot spiders over hairs and a few scattered rice grains. To my surprise, cockroaches managed to spy there too. So far up north. My father destroyed my home. Yes, you may have heard me say Papa before, but when I do so, I'm referring to my foster father. He adopted me after some time later to do, due to a certain circumstances. In any case, my real father was already gone by the time of this story. He wasn't missing or dead or anything, but he owed the Mafia a lot of money. Thus, my mom and I had to constantly keep moving. And in the end, we settled down in what was essentially a literal pigsty. Pigsty. A distant relative lent us the places. Lent us the place. His name was Kano. Or something like that. Apparently, it carries some sort of discriminatory nuisance in that region. But I'm not sure. Kanu gave us a place to stay when we had nowhere else to go. But he was a real son of a bitch with a criminal record to prove it. He might have been doing some day labor. He would sometimes harass my mom by flaunting his earnings. My mom had a few random jobs too, but the village provided few employment opportunities for outsiders. As a result, we could only obey Kanu's every whim. The biggest problem was kero kerosene. The price for kerosene in farming villages is unbelievably high. And when it's cold enough to make your nose run, an empty oil can is practically a death sentence. My mom often made fuel for the heater her top priority. The lack of resources grew more dire each day. We lit that old heater once a day, and that would guarantee us an hour or two of warmth. My mother and I always took the opportunity to wrap ourselves up in sheets and talk about anything and everything. If only we had more money. That's what I always said. I begged for a job as a paper delivery boy, but mom... Oh, excuse me. Mom didn't permit it. She was worried that my body couldn't withstand the cold. She said that walking in the snowy mountains to deliver newspapers would be too harsh for a child. Yet still, our fuel stockpiles were waning by the day, and I think a snowstorm forced the whole village into a shortage. Only one hour was left of the heat warming two hours each day. My school was small, with no more than 50 kids total. I pleaded with them, every single one, to share what they could. And in the end, they passed me off as a beggar and provided nothing, they said. You must be wasting oil all the time. That's why you don't have enough. They didn't share a drop. We never wasted anything. But then I thought that maybe everyone else was in the same situation as we were. But, but we were patiently enduring it. I returned home feeling a bit bad about what I had done, but after thinking about it, it did seem a bit strange. Our fuel was beginning or was being used up faster than we were consuming it. I even begged to suspect my own mother of using the heater in my absence. Shortly thereafter, I met Kanu in front of our shack. He became enraged when he saw me and started yelling desperately. Who do you think you are? Who do you think is letting you live here? That bastard was swinging a jar of kerosene back and forth. I think he stole it from us. I questioned him. He was as muscular as a bear, and his face was always red, as if he was constantly intoxicated. Upon hearing our argument, the people living nearby gathered round. Kanu was a cunning man. He was good at keeping up facades and hiding his true self. He pretended to be a saint helping some outside woman and her young son make ends meet. Thus, in the end, we were the ones in the wrong. Sometimes later, I mentioned it to a school teacher. However, from that one conversation, I finally s understood how the people in the village re viewed my mother and I. Working at a bar on the outskirts of the village seemed to have earned mom a bad reputation. Come on, it was just a bar. Not like she was a prostitute. 
Still, the people in the village use the Hokkaido farming village dialect to humiliate my mom as if she were one. I used this chance and begged my mother to leave the village with me. But she was too exhausted. She was a kind woman, but she was just too exhausted. And there was nowhere to go, so there was really nothing we could have done. And then one day, our heater suddenly began having enough oil to burn through the whole night. Kanu's attitude changed too. He bought stuff for me, trying to win me over. He stopped calling me a brat and sometimes the three of us had dinner together. As a kid, I never wondered why a hypocrite like Kanu suddenly decided to help us. And then I saw why. I saw the sight of a woman lying hogtied screaming in my very own home, no less. Maybe I shouldn't have taken the day off due to illness. The thick smell of alcohol was nearly suffocating. A one liter beer bottled laid upturned on the floor. The bear of a man had just finished drinking and he didn't even try to hide his naked lower body. He just stared at me. I still remember those foul yellow eyes, that face like rock, those hard pulsating muscles. Kanu's strong body, trained by years of manual labor, scarred me to death. Scared me to death. I was overwhelmed. He beat me that night until I was until I thought my stomach would fly out. He kicked me until my back was breaking. My mom protected me, crying nonstop. The son of a bitch just screamed a few curses at her and yanked her body by the hair. He approached her, his breath saturated with the cloying scent of alcohol, all the while staring at me with glaring eyes. Kyosuke, you can't take this, can you? Why can't you take this? Can't you take this? It's all your fault. It's all because you don't have money. The fucker never stopped talking. He reminded us that he was the real owner of our filthy pigsty. Get out if you don't like it, you animals. He proudly stated that he was free to treat his livestock as he pleased. If you animals don't want to accept this, you can get to work. So, Kyosuke, can you feed your mother? Can you rent a house? Can you even go to school? Can you make a living? Mom bowed down and apologized. She said it was our fault. She pretended to be strong, told me she was okay, and then demanded that I apologize immediately to that son of a bitch. I obeyed my mother. Tsubaki's shoulder shivered like she was struck by lightning as she stood silent.